Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Children's Attachment Needs in the Context of Out-of-Home Care. My name is Ellie Robinson, and I'm Executive Manager of Practice, Evidence and Engagement here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. Today, we will hear about attachment theory, what we know from the research and how this can inform placement decision making in the context of out-of-home care. The webinar builds on a practice paper that was published this week. If you haven't already seen the paper, you will receive a copy at the end of the presentation today. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. In Melbourne, the traditional custodians are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to the elders from other communities who may be participating today. I would also like to alert you to some brief housekeeping details before we start. One of the core functions of the CFCA Information Exchange is to share knowledge, so I'd like to invite everyone to submit questions via the chat box at any time during the webinar, and we'll respond to those questions at the end of the presentation. We'd also like you to continue the conversation we begin here today. To facilitate this, we've set up a forum on our website where you can discuss the ideas and issues raised and submit additional questions for our presenters. We will send you a link to the forum at the conclusion of today's presentation. Please remember that this webinar is being recorded and the audio, transcript and presentation slides will be made available on our website and YouTube channel in due course. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Sarah McLean is a registered psychologist and research fellow at the Australian Centre for Child Protection. She has worked in the area of child and adolescent mental health since 1997 and has a particular interest in develop developing effective supports for children in care. Sarah has expertise regarding the psychological issues associated with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and the mental health and behavioural needs of children living in foster and residential care. Sarah was recently awarded the inaugural ACU Lineker Fellowship at Oxford University in recognition of her work supporting children in care. Please join me in giving our presenter a very warm virtual welcome. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Ellie. And thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules <coughs> to join me. Today I'd like to um, talk about broadly about the topic of attachment theory and what it means for the support that we offer children in care. In particular, I wanted to focus on something a little bit different than what I spoke about in the, in the um, practice guide and that is I want to talk a little bit about uh, the theory of attach attachment, um, some of the historical research um, that has been done in that space and really with a view to um, highlighting some of the reasons why perhaps there has been an overemphasis on the connection between challenging behaviour and attachment for children in out-of-home care. So um, I'd really like to focus on that. I'd also like to speak to some of the other um, approaches to supporting children in out-of-home care that might offer us um, more evidence base than, uh, than attachment theory. And I'd also like to highlight some of the ways that attachment therapy, uh, theory sorry, is used um, in out-of-home care, um, particularly ways that it seems to be misunderstood and what the implications might be for, for young people. So very briefly about myself, um, as Ellie mentioned, I'm a registered psychologist. My background has been in child and adolescent mental health and for most of my work as a, a psychologist um, in child and adolescent mental health, I've worked as a senior clinical psychologist in two therapeutic day programs for children with serious and significant mental health issues and particularly with behaviour that um, is of a level of concern uh, and a level of significance that meant that they, children were not able to access normal community facilities or to access schooling and education. And what I realised in that service that around 80% of those children that we were offering um, support to actually 
were living in foster care, residential care, or um, had a history of foster care. So I became interested in how to deliver more effective supports to this group of children. Since starting at the centre, really a lot of my work has been focused on critical analysis and reflection um, about the kind of services that we offer children, uh, about the theories that underpin those services, uh, and some of the myths and misperceptions associated with the needs of children in out-of-home care. And most recently I've been looking um, in particular about some of the contributors to behaviour disorders, to the development of behaviour issues in children in out-of-home care uh, and most recently focused on, have been focusing on prenatal influences including fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and the significant impact of placement stability on children's behaviour and development. So my view is that attachment continues to be an incredibly influential um, theory in out-of-home care practice and policy. Um, it has been for a long time. Uh, I've recently read one study of, in relation to children who were released for adoption in Scottish um, out-of-home care system, and in that analysis of reports um, to the court, 100% of those focused on the attachment needs of the child. It's an incredibly influential theory in out-of-home care practice. And more recently, um, I conducted some work in which I was asking people about their understanding of the challenging behaviour of children in out-of-home care. And in that large-scale study, attachment explanations were most often um, put forward for children's challenging behaviours. So behaviours were explained in terms of attachment issues, attachment disorder and so on. And it's really understandable that attachments take such a, um, such a focus uh, in our work in out-of-home care. It makes intuitive sense to us that we would like, like to think about a children's attachment problems um, because we know that placement in out-of-home care does involve a disruption of a significant, at least one significant relationship. But in reality, attachment theory has very little to say about the needs of children in out-of-home care. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the reasons why there is this overemphasis on the link between behaviour, challenging behaviour and attachment and looking at some, uh, critically evaluating some of the evidence around that. Um, I'd like to put that in context of some of the other evidence-based programs and interventions that we could use to support children. And I'd also like to spend a little bit of time really highlighting some of the ways that attachment theory is used and talk about in, in terms of the needs of children in out-of-home care that really seem very inconsistent with actually what the theory says. And um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to really reflect on what the impact might be for children um, in terms of our decision making about their placement needs and their behavioural needs. My argument is that attachment is the dominant theory um, in relation to challenging behaviour and child protection practice. Uh, I think that's true in Australia and I think that's probably true internationally as well. Certainly in my work I've found this most frequently given explanation for children's needs and particularly for behaviour that challenges placement stability. We as clinicians, as foster parents, um, as people are very motivated to heal and care for children. There really is a, a great attraction to the idea um, that we can heal a child's broken attachment through providing loving care. This is a much better alternative to, than the reality that we may actually have, um, that children may have experienced significant harm in their early life and that we may have to put in sustained and targeted supports to help them recover. Some of the attraction of attachment theory has come from early psychological experiments and many of you will be familiar with um, Har Harry Harlow's experiments on rhesus monkeys where he raised infant monkeys in a cage with pretend mothers made out of wire, uh, one of which was 
uh, a wire mother that delivered food and one of which was a wire mother that was covered in soft cloth. And he was very surprised to find that baby monkeys tended to cling to the soft, wire, the soft cloth covered wire mother rather than the food. So they preferred, his interpretation was, they preferred love over food. And this was a very influential e experiment in attachment theory and has really driven this belief that um, attachment is a formative critical experience of child development. At heart though, attachment theory is a developmental theory and it's not a clinical one. Um, although we frequently hear attachment theory talked about in terms of a clinical or a therapeutic intervention. In reality, attachment theory doesn't tell us much about what to do for children's, to, to support children's attachment needs. Attachment theory is also unique in that it has evolved out of a whole different range of um, evidence bases. It has evolved as a developmental theory, but it's been influenced by evolutionary work, psychodynamic work, behavioural work, and uh, psychiatric diagnostic work. And in some ways, this, this, this um, unique history um, has contributed to the confusion that we have around what attachment is and what's a normal attachment and what's abnormal. Uh, and of course, to the, to the it contributes to confusion about what's a relationship between attachment and behaviour, behaviour problems. So attachment is a theory that's really most salient, most relevant to the first few years of a child's life. It's a developmental theory that um, basically says that the early attachment relationship offers a template of later subsequent relationships and psychosocial development. It places great emphasis on the innate biological drive of the, on the part of the infant to form um, an attachment bond with uh, a responsive caregiver. A central aspect of this is the uh, infant's ability to signal when they are distressed and to elicit comfort on the part of the caregiver. So an intricate part of the attachment bond is the signalling um, and uh, the, the, the way that the child learns to signal distress and to elicit comfort from their caregiver. <clears throat> but it's important to remember this is a really a one-way bond. A, a child forms an attachment with a parent, but a parent doesn't form an attachment with a child. And we often hear that um, confused. So um, a child forms an attachment with a parent because a child learns to elicit comfort from a parent at times of distress. But ideally a parent doesn't do that with a child. So an attachment is the one way bond. And ultimately the result of an attachment experience is the child develops an internal working model and a representation of their caregiver, but also what kind of behaviours they need to engage in in order to elicit comfort from that caregiver and to keep that caregiver close. So it offers a template or a schema or a, um, a kind of a mould for later social behavioural development. Now I'm aware that we have a very mixed audience today so I would like to go back through some of the, the original theory of attachment um, and because I think this is important in understanding how how we've come to emphasise or perhaps overemphasise the link between attachment and behaviour. So our contemporary understanding of attachment theory has come from two largely independent bodies of research and into the role of early attachment experiences and its role in child development. But both of those bodies of literature have looked at behaviour in different ways. So these different approaches and different um, populations has, um, these different study approaches has really contributed to the confusion uh, that exists in the literature about the relationship between attachment and behaviour. Um, there's a whole set of um, behavioural paradigms, experimental paradigms um, devised by psychologists that focus around the strange situation. 
and this is a highly structured assessment tool um, in which you can um, categorise children's attachment um, according to their behaviour. And there's also a set of research that has um, come about through, um, through the work of psychiatrists um, who have catalogued um, or categorised some of the behaviours of children who have been raised in orphanages, in, in environments of prolonged neglect and in the absence of a specific caregiver. So neither of these bodies of evidence really gives us much um, information that is directly applicable to fostered children because um, those bodies of evidence were developed in very different populations. But um, these, these bodies of work have been very influential in embedding this idea that attachment disturbance is synonymous with behavioural disturbance. So the first point I'd like to make is that most attachment is normal, within normal limits. Um, our understanding of attachments and the types of attachments um, that children can form has come about through very structured uh, experimental procedures where children were um, placed in a room with their caregiver, their caregiver left the room so they were subject to a separation and then their caregiver uh, came back in the room so they had a reunification um, after a defined period of time. So it was very structured setting. And what they found is that children in this kind of structured setting behaved in very predictable ways. Um, and importantly, behaviour, the behaviour that the experimenters observed was used to infer something about the child's attachment status and in particular about the internal working model of attachment that they had developed. So as I said, most children uh, responded in very predictable ways. Some children um, were classified based on their behaviour as securely attached. So these children freely expressed emotion and went to the caregiver when the caregiver responded. And that was seen to reflect an internal working model of being loved, um, having a predictable caregiver um, and, being, it, and it being safe to express emotions. Uh, but some children were classified as insecurely attached. Uh, so those that were avoidant uh, minimised their emotional um, expression once a caregiver returned and that was seen as reflecting an internal working model that um, they needed to suppress their emotions in order to keep the caregivers by their side. Similarly, other children were insecurely attached uh, and they had an ambivalent behavioural expression. So these, these children learned to um, overreact or to be really expressive once the caregiver returned. And the, the theory was that these children had developed an internal working model of, of attachment in which they had to be very expressive in order to attract the caregiver's attention. Um, and theoretically because the caregiver was inconsistent with, in, their, um, in their response to their emotions. So that's all a very long-winded way of saying that children in this highly structured experimental situation behaved in, had a set of behaviours that were fairly predictable. But all of these um, ways of behaving are entirely normal and we sometimes forget that when we talk about children's needs in out of home care, we quite often hear about children being avoidantly attached, insecurely attached or ambivalently attached. Um, and I just really want to emphasise the point that this is all within uh, the realms of normal child development. So children outside of out of home care also display these um, behaviours in relation to this strange situation protocol. Um, but they're organised way of responding. So the theory is that these children all had um, a, enough of a consistent response from their caregiver that they were able to form relatively organised, consistent ways of viewing um, their caregiver, consistent ways of um, that they knew they had to behave to elicit comfort from the caregiver. As I said, these are all entirely normal behaviours. Despite this, we hear um, about these behaviours being signs of attachment disorder. However, there was also a group of children who could not be classified 
um, that is, they didn't have a consistent way of responding where their caregiver returned and these children were classified as having a disorganised attachment. That is, they hadn't had a consistent enough experience of caregiving to have developed this internal, consistent internal working model. These children um, were thought, said to have a disorder, organised attachment style and thought to have no consistent way of representing attachment. These young people, um, with a disorganised attachment um, are, have been shown to be at increased risk of dissociative symptoms in adolescence or, or um, uh, mental health issues later in life. Um, but we're really unclear still about how, that, how disorganised attachment um, during the early years, um, if you measure disorganised attachment in this highly structured situation, how that actually relates or it turns into psychopathology later on in life. We certainly also um, know that disorganised attachment is linked with certain caregiving characteristics such as having unresolved trauma, not being emotionally available, being frightening or behaving in frightening ways to the child. Uh, and that's gone into, we, I go into that in more detail with the in the practice paper. So um, although behavioural observations and observations about behaviour um, were key in discovering and uncovering these attachment styles. Um, all of these, most of these behaviours were within the normal um, realm of normal um, child development, um, and only um, were only demonstrated in this highly structured situation. Um, and despite this, the belief still persists that. Um, we can um, observe, we can determine children's attachment from observing their behaviour. And I really just wanted to emphasise that you cannot um, make that distinction outside of this highly structured and well validated assessment situation called the strange situation. Um, and also the other point I wanted to make about disorganised attachment is it's considered a very temporary um, immobilisation um, involving bizarre behaviours but it's a temporary response to, um, to an attachment insecurity uh, in the presence of a caregiver. So it can't be assessed outside the presence of the caregiver. So the second body of work that has been influential in linking attachment to challenging behaviour has been the work on reactive attachment disorder. Um, and this body of work came from um, studies of orphans who were uh, orphans who were raised in institutions uh, under conditions of prolonged neglect and in the absence of a specific caregiver. And unlike these other attachment classifications, these diagnoses were made in when these children met strangers in, in response to their behaviour to strangers rather than in the caregiving context. And there were two types of, so psych, psychiatrists observed these children and categorised children according to two strong behavioural clusters. The first was the disinhibited reactive attachment disorder, which was marked by indiscriminate social behaviour, not recognising um, uh, for strangers from familiar people, not making that distinction, disinhibited behaviour. And the second form was an extremely inhibited social behaviour, so not being receptive and responsive to social interaction, being extremely reserved and hypervigilant. So two very distinct but very marked behavioural presentations um, that arose and that were documented in the context of prolonged neglect and prolonged absence of a specific caregiver. We know that um, attachment, reactive attachment disorders are extremely rare. We also now know um, with the advent of the DSM-5 that this first type of reactive attachment disorder, the one with the most marked behavioural characteristics, is actually now not considered to be an attachment disorder at all um, and so the name has now been changed to disorder of social engagement to reflect the fact that it's actually more about social violations or social, a disorder of socialisation rather than an attachment disorder. So children who are adopted, um, who have this diagnosis and then who are adopted do change their attachment classification. They, so it's independent of attachment is what I'm trying to say. Um, 
So um, the attachment experience does not account for the behaviour. And yet the belief uh, persists that disinhibited behaviour um, and poor social boundaries is an attachment issue. Okay, so very briefly to put this all in perspective, um, we acknowledge that attachment is a key developmental influence for kids. It shapes, um, it could be it can be seen more like uh, a shaping, inf a per a sh uh, an influence that shapes children's personalities in all of these areas. So it shapes their emotion, the capacity for emotional regulation. Um, it shapes what they believe about the behaviours they need to engage in in order to keep a caregiver to be to be um, loved by a caregiver or to keep a caregiver close. It shapes how they view themselves and others and their world views about safety in the world and the safety of themselves and safety of others. And it also influences or shapes um, whether they are rewarded by social consequences or they have a pro-social orientation. So it kind of shapes personality, but it doesn't, there's no evidence that it trumps other factors such as placement stability, high quality parenting, good social connections and other opportunities. And yet we persist in that belief, particularly in relation to children in care. Okay, so neither, uh, neither attachment, neither of these attachment difficulties, disorganised attachment or reactive attachment disorder, um, really contributes much to um, our knowledge about what to do in out of home care practice. We know that disorganised attachment is um, more common in, in maltreatment but it's, um, and it's linked to later pathology, but it's um, specific to the caregiving relationship. It can't be um, demonstrated outside of that and it's normally a temporary um, response to uh, activation of attachment need. It, we can't actually document it outside of that uh, strange situation. Um, so we we kind of can think of it more of as, as a state of being rather than a trait. So something that's temporary, not enduring. Um, and uh, we know that it's late, linked to later psychopathology, but we really don't know exactly what the pathway is. We just don't have enough information about that. Um, and similarly with reactive attachment disorder, it also doesn't offer us much in terms of understanding behaviour of children in out of home care. Um, the one form of the disorder that was high, that was associated with strong behavioural presentation and disinhibited pr presentation has now been um, accepted not to be an attachment disorder as such. Um, and there are other potential explanations for this kind of disinhibited behaviour that we sometimes see in children in out of home care. And one that springs to mind for me is of course um, the presentation of children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder who can present in this very disinhibited way. Okay, so all of that is a very long-winded way of saying that um, um, there's good reasons why we have historically overemphasised the link between attachment and behaviour, but that that, uh, attach that relationship is not really supported by the literature. The second point I wanted to make was whether um, we could have more impact on children's lives by um, focusing on placements, focusing on more evidence-based approaches to supporting children with challenging behaviour and therefore supporting placement stability. So this table gives you an overview of the kind of disorders, for want of a better word, the kind of difficulties that kids can have in out-of-home care that are common to out-of-home care, that are clearly associated with neuropsychological difficulties and that, are, that have well-documented um, treatment approaches. And so you'll see here, for example, that conduct disorder conservatively um, and reliably um, is estimated to occur in around 60% of the out-of-home care population, 10 times more common than regular in the regular population. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we think something in, in the vicinity of 17% of children in out-of-home care and so on. You can see learning difficulties, 37%, anxiety, 11%. Um, 
Um, in contrast, reactive attachment disorder is a very small proportion of children in out-of-home care. Um, and while disorganised attachment is very common in out-of-home care, as assessed in this very prescribed um, situation, the strange situation, um, it is also commonly found, 10 to 15 per cent of the population um, who are not in out-of-home care uh, ex exhibit disorganised attachment in that assessment situation. Um, and you'll see in the right hand um, uh, column, what I'm trying to emphasise there is there are well documented interventions for any of these other disorders that are also associated with challenging behaviour. Um, what we are lacking is well documented interventions for disorganised attachment. Okay, so the third um, issue that I really want to highlight um, is to talk about some of the misunderstandings and misapplication of attachment theories that I have come across, um, together with some of the limitations uh, or the implications of these misunderstandings that I think I really want to highlight. The first really relates um, to the use of attachment theory in general, but um, to the idea of attachment disorders um, and the related literature. Um, and my view is that it doesn't, the literature surrounding attachment disorders, neither the literature related to disorganised attachment or reactive attachment disorder really offers us any useful information in terms of developing supports for children in out-of-home care. I really want to emphasise that attachment theory is not a clinical theory. It does not offer clinical guidance, um, generally speaking, but of course it has been used in that way. I'd really like to encourage us to look for factors outside of attachment to explain children's behaviour um, and really look at more look at simpler explanations that offer more in terms of the direction for our intervention and our supports. So we know from um, reviews of uh, brain development in early life uh, in, in the context of adversity that um, there are well-defined, um, well-documented issues such as memory difficulties, executive functioning difficulties, um, things like high levels of anxiety. Um, we have a very good um, record of the kind of issues that young people in out-of-home care can experience. Um, we might do better for young people to focus on those issues where there are well-supported interventions rather than focusing on um, uh, trying to attain a secure attachment. And one of the issues for me is that if we are really focusing on attachment all the time, what does that mean then if the placement isn't stable? What are the implications? What are we saying about children? And what are we saying about carers? If, if um, the placement becomes unstable, um, are we saying that it's a failure of the child to attach or is it a failure of the child, of the foster carer to develop, um, provide nurturing care? Could there be other explanations that offer more in terms of a way forward? Um, the other point I'd like to make is that attachment's been widely criticised because it lacks a consensus definition around terminology and this opens the door for a drift or a broadening of concepts to, to include virtually anything. So some of the, the concepts that I've heard discussed in the context of children's needs include their attachment bond, their attachment relationship, their attachment behaviours, attachment and trauma, and the most recent attachment trauma. Um, it's, it's a real issue for me that we, we really need to um, become a little bit more clear about what we're talking about when we're talking about children's attachment. If we have a group of professionals, and typically there's multiple people involved in making decisions about young people's lives, we don't want um, a, to be is it helpful to be using a concept that is so open to interpretation? Or are there other ways we could talk about children's needs? 
um, much of the discussion about placement needs of children in care focuses on the need to form a primary attachment. What I'd like to highlight is that children form multiple attachments at a very young age um, and uh, in some ways us pursuing a primary attachment to a foster care, um, should, we, should, we need to be careful that it's not done at the expense of other children's other significant relationships. That doesn't mean that a primary carer isn't important but a primary carer is different from the idea that a child needs a primary attachment figure uh, after a certain age. In my view, um, the seeking a primary attachment figure can be misleading and that decisions about where a child lives and how often they should have contact are much better based on issues of safety, the child's developmental need, how unsettling family contact is, the child's wishes, um, rather than the, than the rationale of developing a primary attachment. The other difficulty that we're faced with in out-of-home care is that a foster care, um, a placement in a foster care setting, a uh, foster care home, is not going to be, in most cases, the child's first attachment and yet we do treat it as though it is. We don't know very much, um, there isn't very much literature about whether this kind of placement and this kind of attachment bond that a child forms with their foster parent is or is as protective in terms of mental health outcomes as their original attachment. We don't know how that interacts with other things including placement stability, um, child's developmental age and so on. Um, but there has been a little bit of preliminary work which, which, um, which shows that children are unlikely actually to form a secure attachment um, subsequent to their original attachment um, if their original attachment wasn't, wasn't secure. So it may be that they end up forming the same similar kind of attachment to their foster parent that they had with their mother or their parent. But the research in this area is really in its infancy. So are we, are we actually being realistic if we are pursuing the holy grail of the secure attachment? There is also no reason to believe that there are any cultural differences in attachment in terms of the distribution of attachment organisation. So what I mean is that if you put the children in any country that's where it's been measured through the strange situation protocol which is the only um, well-established um, assessment tool for young children, uh, then the, the uh, proportion of behaviour uh, attachment organisations comes out very similar. But what is different is cultural def definitions of what a good parenting is um, and what a responsive parenting is and there are cultural differences in what we value in terms of children's um, development. So we tend to value self-efficacy, exploration, whereas other cultures might value independence, interdependence, dependency and so on. So there are cultural um, conditions around how we um, assess attachment and parenting. Um, another significant point is that we really don't know much about attachment beyond the first few years, uh, where there are rigorous assessment protocols and it's been well researched. We don't know um, how early attachment experiences interact and with later peer, develop, peer social relationships, um, the rel relative importance of peer relationships as children enter school age or wider family relationships and how does their attachment experience interact with their developing you know, awareness of the world and so on. We don't know much about that. Um, even as I mentioned earlier, even the attachment theorists and attachment development theorists do not themselves state um, that attachment determines later development. Rather they view it as a template or a schema or a kind of a foundation of later development. Um, and when we look at attachment interventions, when we go to the literature and look at attachment interventions, um, when, when people have, when um, a large meta-analysis, when we look at a meta-analytic meta um, 
uh, work that's been done on effective attachment interventions, we actually find that effective attachment interventions are very focused, um, very discreet in their time limit, they're targeted to younger children and they are very behavioural in the sense of they're focusing on parenting sensitivity. So if we want to do, develop attachment interventions, we need to ensure all of those criteria are met. And I would argue that often those things aren't um, and that generally our support for foster parents tends to be quite um, broad. Okay, so just to finish now, um, I just wanted to finish on a couple of points. Really just to emphasise that there's really not um, a great deal of support for the direct link between behaviour um, disorder, or so-called attachment behaviour, um, and attachment experience. Although we know that attachment, relation, uh, attachment relationship is related to later functioning, but we don't know what the pathway is for that. So compared to social learning theories of behaviour, the evidence is really poor. Um, just to call something an attachment intervention doesn't mean that it is having an effect through changing attachment. And indeed many effective attachment interventions are quite behavioural in focus. So that still leads us to ask, is an attachment lens actually value adding um, in terms of what we want to do to support children's needs in out of home care? And what would happen if we were to park um, or set aside our um, ideas about attachment and particularly the, 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 um, the drive that we have to, to set up a primary attachment and a secure attachment. What would that mean then? Would that, um, would that uncover different ways that we could support children in care? Um, would it be helpful, for example, to recast attachment difficulties um, in terms of an anxiety um, disorder, um, which then opens up to really sound evidence-based approaches that we can support children with? Um, would it be better to, to talk in terms of social learning or trauma integration ther therapies, uh, which have much stronger evidence base than attachment therapies? 